Recently, we pondered some of the most inexplicable ultimate costumes, but just why? Let's go! <gasps> yeah, you and me both, hey Hachi. A scan of the YouTube comments reveals there are plenty more outlandish outfits that have baffled you, the outside Xbox audience, over the years. So here are seven more ultimate costumes that will be showing up on this year's Vogue Most Confusing list. This is embarrassing. Don't beat yourself up over it. Wow, I am annoying. Mortal Kombat's Johnny Cage has had a history of dodgy outfits, starting with his cyclist pirate look from the original Mortal Kombat. But, as commenter Ewan Callister points out, Ninja Mime Johnny Cage in Mortal Kombat X is a baffling costume. Why on earth would Johnny wear that into battle? Ninja Mime, tagline, he's silent but deadly, is one of Johnny Cage's movies whose plot is entirely summed up by the title, we expect. The Ninja Mime outfit is what Johnny wore in the title role, although he seems to have missed the key component of being a mime in that he never bloody shuts up. What do you want? So is ice creaming out, world chubby? Otherwise, the get-up is pretty standard mime gear, with a jaunty bowler hat and makeup, only slightly ruined by Johnny's refusal to take off his sunglasses. Just steer clear the face. Don't mess up the hair. Deal. That said, I don't think I've ever seen a mime punch someone in the nuts so hard that their head fell off. I mean, thankfully. Silent Hill is known as a dark and harrowing horror series, but it has a sense of humor too. Like when that dog turned out to be behind it all. <laughs> all that time you vomited out the fetus of a dark god who would bring about the apocalypse. You probably had to be there. In Silent Hill 3, that sense of humor extended to the costumes as well, as pointed out by commenter I Never Wanted 2010, who says, The Princess Heart costume had a Sailor Moon-esque transformation sequence upon being equipped, and it even granted you special powers. Yes, thanks to the power of the Transform costume, Heather could change into the powerful Princess Heart, which made her look like she'd come to Silent Hill straight from appearing in Space Channel 5 and hadn't had time to change. It also gave Heather access to the Sexy Beam, an upgraded version of the Heather Beam that let her fire lasers out of her eyes while whispering, Sexy, at any twisted nightmare monsters in earshot, because who knows. I'm not sure what she's listening to on those headphones either, but I think we can hazard a guess. What you're seeing is advanced warfare. Atlas has the single largest standing military in the world, but we answer to no country. Unlike the government, we don't keep secrets of our capabilities. When you're a futuristic soldier in the employ of Kevin Spacey, you want to look as intimidating as possible. I mean, what if Kevin Spacey was to drop by unexpectedly? Oh good, here he is. Someone we can help you with, sir. Well, a glass would be a start. If it had been my decision, at that point, I would have been wearing my most fearsome combat gear. Although, as commenter Ben Buster Beast points out, not all of Advanced Warfare's exo-rigs necessarily made the most sense. No Advanced Warfare clown or gingerbread suit. Those made me question the developer. Yeah! Turns out some of Advanced Warfare's gear sets were eccentric. There were the aforementioned clown and gingerbread suits, which I mean, yes, terrifying, but possibly not in the way that you intend in a Call of Duty game, as well as luchador gear, sea monsters, and a ready-to-boogie board ensemble straight out of the spring summer catalog. Our favorite, though, is the conquistador outfit, just because we want to see exactly how long an actual 16th century Spanish conquistador would last in a round of advanced warfare. We're guessing they exo-jump their head into a low ceiling about 10 seconds into the match. Think she's going. You want to head out with the boss? That'll be the day. 
When Metal Gear Solid 5's supernatural sniper Quiet was first revealed and shown to be wearing a combat bikini, a lot of people were like, hey, Kojima, what gives? Hideo Kojima replied, it's cool guys, there's a good reason for it, to which people in turn responded, oh that's good, we thought it'd be something stupid like she breathes through her skin. Well, turns out that Quiet's outfits could get even dumber, as pointed out by commenter Redstone Casey, who says, what about the gold skin for Quiet in MGS5? As bad ideas go, painting a super-powered sniper gold is right up there with giving the Velociraptor a cheerleading outfit. If the original Quiet costume had one thing going for it, it was that it was relatively inconspicuous for tactical operations in Afghanistan and Africa, even if it did mean that Quiet would be spending at least half of her mission pay on sunscreen. Her alternate costumes, in which she is painted gold and silver, lose that benefit by making her the shiniest thing in a 30-mile radius. If you thought the glint off a sniper's scope was a giveaway, wait until you see someone painted bright gold try and blend into the background. Plus, it's really bad for you even if you don't need to breathe through your skin. Quiet, haven't you ever seen Goldfinger? Another one of her alternate outfits is almost as confusing as pointed out by commenter Nick Murphy. Quiet's full gear outfit from Metal Gear Solid. She breathes through her skin, which is their plausible, brackets almost, excuse for why she dresses so skimpily, so why would she cover up if it would almost suffocate her? I don't know, Nick, and we're unlikely to get an answer now that Kojima's moved on to new projects. I hear Norman Reedus breathes through his skin. Huh? Hey, is this thing on? What's this one? Oh, oh this one. <laughs> What's that? Zack from the Dead or Alive fighting game. and occasional softcore volleyball series is a flamboyant guy. But none of his outfits come close to matching the one mentioned by commenter Whammytime91, who says, Alien Zack from Dead or Alive, I'll say no more. Yeah, I mean, this really is the kind of costume that speaks for itself, with the antenna and the neon piping and the TV screen. He looks like a Teletubby trying to bring back Rain, or an invader from the planet EDM, or a Pikmin who got a job at Cyber Dogs. Do I hate him? Bill, what else are you going to wear when fighting cursed skeletons? Ah, that's probably fixable. But Bill will sort that right out. Calm down. Everything's going to be just fine. My name's Leon. I'm under the president's order to rescue you. What? My father? That's right. And I have to get you out of here. Now come with me. When Resident Evil 4 first came out, the only bonus costumes you could unlock were a pop star outfit for Ashley and an RCPD uniform for Leon, because I guess he helped himself to a bunch of old uniforms on his way out after Resident Evil 2. What? Not like those guys are gonna use them. Here, take this key card. You should be able to unlock the doors in the hall with this. Now go. In later versions of the game, however, there were a second set of outfits to unlock, as suggested by commenter Mason Sullivan, who says, Leon and Ashley's second outfit option in RE4. Seriously, why gangster and knight? Did they get invited to a costume party and get lost on the way? Yes, Leon has, for some reason, turned up for his incredibly important mission to find the president's daughter, dressed like a member of the chorus from Chicago. Leon, I hope you can hear me. I'm Ingrid Hannigan. I'll be your support on this mission. Loud and clear. 
Somehow I thought you'd be a little older. Hey, at least he brought the gun with him. Ashley's second costume, a suit of heavy plate armor, is just as ridiculous, but actually way more useful in that it stops anyone from being able to kill her and stops anyone from being able to pick her up. And if you recall, the two worst things about Ashley were that people were always killing her and picking her up. Doesn't do anything about the voice, however. Help! Seriously? who is never going to run out of things to wear is Juliet Starling from Lollipop Chainsaw, as suggested by commenter Michaela Knight Older, who says, not so much inexplicable as it is weird in a good way, but the Lollipop Chainsaw alternate skin needs a very good side note to stick in the manual. Now, Michaela doesn't specify which of Juliet's alternate outfits they're talking about, but there are plenty to choose from, between bikinis and a giant rabbit outfit and her dad for some reason. This is so irritating. I don't even want to know. Our favorite, however, is the Ash Williams costume, in which Juliet dresses as Bruce Campbell's character from the Evil Dead films. Because if you're going to be killing zombies, you may as well be dressed for it. There's some stuff I didn't tell you before, okay? I didn't want you to think I was weird. Hail to the queen, baby. Those were more alternate outfits from video games that needed explaining. Thank you for watching this video, and if you want to watch more videos like this, we have a video here suggested by YouTube to be the best video for you at this current time. And over here, we have a playlist of more videos that are like this one, but crucially, not this one. Although, it might be the same as that one. We've been doing that a lot lately, so we don't actually know. Video game characters spend a lot of time wearing the same one outfit. Like, I dread to think what Mario's overall smell like by now. So you can understand that they occasionally want to express themselves by wearing something a bit different. But we were thinking more along the lines of some new shoes or a jaunty hat rather than these crimes against fashion, nature and copyrighted intellectual property. Just consider these unlockable video game character outfits that have some serious explaining to do. That's it. Queen Zenobia. Oh jeez. More like what's left of her. You start off Resident Evil Revelations playing as Jill Valentine and her partner Parker Luciani, who actually looks a bit like Chris Redfield if someone left him hooked up to an air pump for slightly too long. It's been 94 minutes since Chris and Jessica dropped off the radar. But the interpolation from their last known coordinates puts them right here on the ship. But before long, control switches to Chris and his partner Jessica. Incidentally, she is the most aggravating character in Resident Evil history, which is saying something. Chris, I'm cold. I'm tired. Carry me. Slow down, Chris. Was your old partner prettier than me? Did he like her more than me? Do you trust me as much as Jill? There's no need to compare. I trust you both. Now, I know what you're thinking. Tactical combat gear again? Come on, Chris. Change the record. Haven't you got anything else you could be wearing? Well, yes, he does. If you do more than 100,000 points of damage to an enemy in raid mode, you unlock Chris's sailor outfit. This is apparently the ensemble Chris picked out when someone told him that his new game was going to be set on a boat, so he'd better pack something nautical. From the short shorts, to the too small shirt, to the anchor tattoo, to the gloves, this really reads as naval-themed strippogram more than tactical operations at sea, Chris. Also, what's with the pipe? Is this like a Popeye thing? A Popeye-themed strippers of thing? What do I say? Of course they are. Anyway, at least somebody is finally dressed less appropriately for the mission than Jessica, I cut one of the legs off my wetsuit Sherawan. Maybe it's the weather, but I still can't make contact with HQ. Oh, beast! I will send you back to the depths of Hades! In the God of War games, hero Kratos becomes the God of War by killing the previous holder of that title, Ares. As you'd expect from someone who literally kills gods, Kratos cuts a pretty intimidating figure with his loincloth, gauntlets, and blades of chaos. But that outfit insufficiently conveys Kratos' love of milk. 
If his alternate choice of costume is anything to go by, the Dairy Bastard outfit, unlocked by completing the Challenge of the Gods, is a cow suit with a bell around the neck and distractingly prominent others. When in this costume, Kratos forgoes the Blades of Chaos, instead choosing to attack with a pair of milk jugs that he swings about the place. Yeah, I don't know either, but judging by his pose on the outfit select screen, Kratos is pretty into it. Look, are you going to tell him he looks stupid? Sleeping Dogs tells the story of Wei Shen, a cop who goes undercover to infiltrate the Sun on Yi Triad gang. Wei is specifically chosen for his troubled past, his aptitude for criminal behavior, and his ties to Hong Kong's crime families. And much of the game is spent on a knife edge as the Triad gang members come close to figuring out that Wei isn't one of them. Which is why Wei's decision to walk around dressed in a full Hong Kong Police Department beat cop uniform is such a baffling one. Wei, we've been waiting for you. You guys smell something? This outfit is a reward from one of the game's DLCs, but it really seems like the sort of thing you would politely accept, then toss in the river when no one is looking, rather than wearing it to all your important crime meetings. Wei, don't turn up in a squad car, man. What are you doing? Man, Wei, you are so lucky that the Son on Yi are the dumbest tryouts ever. Are you guys actually listening to this asshole? He's a rat! He's a fucking rat! In Tekken 4 series, Patriarch Heihachi Mishima swapped his traditional black gi for a fundoshi, traditional Japanese underwear. Which would be fine if he'd picked a colour like red or blue, but he didn't. He picked white, so it looks like he's fighting in a giant diaper and not much else. What he loses in style points, he gains in manoeuvrability and absorbency. What's more, this underwear doesn't provide great coverage for the uh, rear, meaning that you get a glimpse of Heihachi's 74-year-old buttock, which, to be fair to him, are looking pretty good. He clearly spends a lot of time clenching. It's not necessarily a surprise that someone of Heihachi's advanced years might have a problem with incontinence. It's just that normally you'd wear something else over the top of your adult diaper. <laughs> Batman's costume is designed to strike fear into the hearts of his enemies, which is why it looks less like a bat and more like some kind of terrifying robot Dracula. But when you're out on the streets of Gotham night after night punching loiterers, you're bound to get bored. So you fancy trying something new. Also, you're a billionaire. Gotta spend all that money on something. I mean, apart from sustainable projects to lower Gotham's crime rate. So that's why Batman decided to wear a version of the costume worn by Adam West in the 1960s Batman series. As you may recall, this Batsuit was little more than a lycra body stocking with some silk accessories and hardly the sort of thing you'd want to be wearing while fighting crime in the grim and gritty Arkham universe. Fine for a Batman who spent most of his time dancing, surfing and going jogging with cartoon bombs, less so for one who more or less constantly gets shot at. Maybe he's starting to see you. The real you. Still, it's less distracting than the Batman Beyond skin, which does without the cable together, lending it a definite Ned Flanders vibe. Feels like I'm wearing nothing at all. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. Ah, stupid sexy Batman. Don't you just hate it when you're in a hurry to leave the house and you have no clean clothes, so you just have to throw an octopus on and run. I mean, that's the only explanation I can come up with for Anna's ultimate costume in Tekken Tag Tournament 2, which is basically a naked Anna wearing a squid on her head. Anna is usually found wearing a stylish satin chong sam with matching gloves, which makes it all the more baffling that when not wearing that, she'd go outside wrapped in a cephalopod mollusk. Are they working together? Does she know it's there? Or does she keep wondering why all the other fighters are looking at her funny? That's going to be quite the shock when she looks in the mirror. Ready. Fight. 
Ripsaw from Killer Instinct is a dinosaur-human hybrid bred to be the perfect killing machine. Exactly like Vincent D'Onofrio wanted to do in Jurassic World, only less stupid because it actually worked. Anyway, seeing as Riptor is a dinosaur-human hybrid, it makes sense that it would want to wear clothes. That's the human part of the brain taking over. What makes less sense is that it would want to wear a cheerleading outfit. One of the central themes of Jurassic Park was that you shouldn't try and control nature or dinosaurs will eat you. So congratulations to whoever managed to cram an angry raptor into a pleated miniskirt. I mean, posthumous congratulations, I assume. I, for one, wouldn't be able to concentrate on the game I was playing knowing that at any second the cheer squad could leap across the pitch and disembowel me with their razor-sharp talons. Might make you run faster, I suppose? In Street Fighter Cross Tekken, the two titanic fighting game franchises shared the same stage for the first time. And that's not all they share. The alternate character swap outfits, which were released as DLC, see the stars of one series borrow the clothes from the other in a show of friendship. So Vega swaps his traditional mask for Yoshimitsu's, Julia adopts Chun-Li's distinctive hair buns and dress, and Akuma borrows Heihachi's outfit. Yes, that one. I really hope it was washed before. Questionable hygiene aside, this all seems like a good-natured cultural exchange between two of the biggest series in fighting games. That is, until you get to this. Tammy, you ready? Hold on. Did Chun-Li skin Panda? Yes, we're pretty sure Greenpeace would have something to say about the fact that the first lady of the Street Fighter series is wearing the head of an endangered animal as a trophy. You've probably got the idea from Zangief, who is currently wearing Kuma as casual loungewear. Still, ask yourself this. Which is the greater crime? That? Or this. The defense rests. Those were eight of the most inexplicable alternate outfits in games. Thanks for watching, and if you would like more from Outside Xbox, don't forget to subscribe and also like if you enjoyed it. But before you go, may I hook you up with another video? This one here is recommended by YouTube itself. Who are we to argue with YouTube? And this one here is a playlist of lots more videos, kind of like the one you've just enjoyed, hopefully. Making a video game is a lot of hard work, which is why it's occasionally tempting to take the afternoon off and let the work experience kid program a level for you. That's the only explanation we have for the existence of these terrible levels which nearly ruined everything in otherwise great games. Enjoy this video as far as is possible, which is based on a suggestion by YouTube commenter Skynet091287. Thanks, Skynet091287, for both the topic and for not becoming self-aware and destroying humanity. Also, watch out for spoilers ahead for the following games. Vamanos, the underworld lies just beyond the sound barrier. What do you do? That's like super classified demon information. <sighs> not according to the internet. Shadows of the Damned is one of the weirdest games ever. It stars a man named Garcia F Hotspur, yes, that's his middle name, who hangs around with a talking skull called Johnson who can transform into a motorbike. Johnson is also connected to Hotspur's gun, which is called Boner. Because it fires bones is the reason. I... Beneath all that weirdness, though, is a fun shooter with some inventive ideas, which is why we were so infuriated by the game's big Boner section. I swear I'm not making this up. At one point, late in the game, Garcia and Johnson stumble across a phone booth. Johnson then calls a sex line, which makes him quadruple in size, turning him into, well... <laughs> now that is a big boner. Yes, thanks, Garcia. 
What this means for you, the player, is a section in which you're rooted to the spot while giant demons walk towards you and you shoot at them with your powered up Johnson. Not helping matters is the fact that your new firearm is very slow, not very accurate, and the fact that Garcia won't stop shouting, taste my big boner, every time you hit an enemy. Taste my big boner! Right, like that. Oh, and you have to do the section three times because f*** you. Taste my big boner! Oh, it's a dick joke. I get it now. Taste my big boner! When I saw the fancy get up of Salieri's boys, I thought that it can't be too bad to work for them. Besides, I had nothing to lose. Morello was out to get me, so driving a cab wasn't the best job. Plus, the prospect of Salieri's dough wasn't so terrible. In Mafia Cliché Simulator Mafia, you checked all the classic Mafia shenanigans off your to-do list. Wear a good suit, organize crime, that accent. I like to take him into the outfit, boss. You can see he ain't scared, but he's done real good. Enact hits on rival crime families, be an old-time racing driver. You really want me to do this? I've never raced before. Wait, what? Oh yeah, in case you'd forgotten, a couple hours into Mafia, it went suddenly from the Godfather to Rush. The game jammed you into the teeny cockpit of a 1930s racing car, then left you to settle your differences with a decidedly dicey Grand Prix track. Spoiler, the track came out on top. This driving segment was jarring, finicky, and how you say, not good. As is so often the case with racing segments attempted in anything other than a racing game, and also sometimes in an actual racing game. I don't know what made Mafia think it was the game to nail vintage motorsport simulation, but evidently Mafia didn't nail it, because eventually the developers hacked in the option to skip this whole segment, instead of yet again flipping your car like a 100 mile per hour road burger, landing on your head and dying, as was the style at the time. Oh, and speaking of crappy races in otherwise great games... Knights of the Old Republic, God, that's my favourite Star Wars game. It was, uh, if I remember correctly, I want to say, perfect. No, wait, it's coming back to me. Ah, how can I forget the swoop race on Taris? I tried so hard to forget. You know, that was the one initial swoop race the game made you do just to check if you enjoyed it and to see if you wanted to do it on a bunch more planets all around the galaxy. Spoiler, you didn't. Swoop racing for the uninitiated is like pod racing in The Phantom Menace, but not so devastatingly interesting or integral to the plot or as much of a good use of several minutes of your short, finite human life. The way to win this stupidly fast and fiddly bit of exotic gameplay was to be a hummingbird, or, failing that, cheat it by hammering the pause button to slow down the game, then steer frame by frame. Very exciting. Uh, but if you need me, I'll just be off having Jedi space adventures with Bastila and Car. All right. There's movement up ahead. Is it soldiers? I am in something of a hurry. Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag is brilliant. It's brilliant mostly because it just lets you get on with being a pirate of the Caribbean, doing piracy in exotic locations, boarding ships, finding treasure, singing sea shanties, and petting dogs. Interesting history fact, pirates were super into that. The game also included stealth sections because that's a key part of the Assassin's Creed series. What you might not have been expecting were sections of ship stealth. That's right, stealth sections where you had to be stealthy while sailing a 50 meter tall pirate ship. This mission in particular, where you have to tail a gunboat, starts strong with Blackbeard threatening people. So I must confirm that you men are the pariahs of Charles Dunn. Hey, Chloe. Better by using your organs for chum and your bones for cha. And looks great, what with the moonlit swamp full of crocodiles. It soon becomes clear, though, that ship stealth is the actual worst as you crawl along at a snail's pace with watchtowers everywhere that will insta-fail you if you're detected. Plus, you're not even allowed to sing sea shanties as you go, so what's even the point? This mission is like a greatest hits compilation of the worst things about the Assassin's Creed games, including tailing a slow thing, eavesdropping on conversations, and chasing people and instantly failing if they get too far away. If only Sean Hastings had turned up, we would have had a full house.
So, look who's here. So you didn't forget, after all, you're just incredibly rude. Like poor Rebecca here, wait for nearly 30 minutes. The Big Daddies are a constant, menacing presence throughout the whole of Bioshock 1. Fiercely protective of their little sisters by means of their rivet guns and massive drills, the Big Daddies are Bioshock's most badass enemy. So when you actually become one towards the end of the game, you would be expecting something pretty awesome, right? Especially since the process of becoming a Big Daddy is such a hassle. That includes finding the right gear, getting vocal cord surgery, and covering yourself in Big Daddy sweat? Ew. That's why it's so disappointing that when you do become a big daddy, it makes essentially no difference to the game whatsoever. There's no cool drill arm, no powerful melee, no weird whale song noise button. You just nope. plod around on an escort quest fighting oh. waves and slices while your little sister does that gross oh. thing with the needle. I don't know how many waves of slices it is, but it's, I'm going to guess 400 because that's what it felt like. You don't even have to be a good big daddy. If your little sister dies, you just get another one from the vent. The little one falls. You can call for another at the vent. But to lose even one is a... Meow. Yeah, well, so are escort quests and waves of enemies. So I guess we're even ten and back. Ready, Batman? Ready, Oracle. Go on. The makers of Arkham Knight at Studio Rocksteady were obviously very proud of their Batmobile, and with good reason, that thing's badass. Running diagnosis. Thermal imaging shows the Arkham Knight's tanks are unmanned and controlled remotely. You're clear to engage. Weapon systems online. Be careful. Maybe they were a bit too proud, though, and that's how we ended up with the Batmobile platforming sections. The anchor point is secure to the wall. I can't move it using the Batmobile. Maybe it can hold the car's weight. And Batmobile puzzle sections. And oh my god, the Batmobile combat sections. So many Batmobile combat sections. The best, or is that the worst example of this, is the final Batmobile combat section in the game, in which it asks you to fight 62 drones outside the GCPD headquarters. 62! There are things that I quite like doing that I don't want to do 62 times in a row. I like a cup of tea, for instance, but if you offered me 62 of them, I would decline after, like, the 17th or 18th cup. Given that it's not much fun fighting one drone, asking you to do that 62 times to finish the game is seriously at odds with the reason people buy a Batman game. Spoiler, it's to be Batman. The only thing sources agree on is his name. The Arkham Knight. Right, that's the stuff. Not clunky vehicle combat sections in which you are basically a big gun on wheels. This is the worst thing to ever happen to Batman. What about parents murder? This is worse. Resident Evil 4 is one of mankind's greatest accomplishments, and if you ask me, it should be prominently displayed in the Louvre instead of that dumb painting of the lady with the wanton smile. But like the ancient carpet makers who worked a deliberate flaw into their work because only God can create perfection, the developers of Resident Evil 4 decided to include the water room in their game. The water room is a multi-part section full of endless cultists, snipers, cultists with shields, cranks, cultists who will straight up throw scythes at your head, and sniping sections where you have to protect Ashley, who I think I may have mentioned before, is constantly getting kidnapped. She gets kidnapped so often, she lists her permanent address as over the shoulder of a cultist. <laughs> Classic move. Look, there's a crank over there. Anyway, all this is in service of moving some platforms into place so that Leon and Ashley can get across the small amount of water that gives the room its name. If only there were some other way of human beings moving through water, but there definitely isn't. Still, at least we got Ashley through fine and she's safe forever. You all right? I'm fine! Leave me alone! Ashley, wait! <laughs> Damn it, Ashley. Of course, you owe us nothing, Mr. Freeman, but you've come this far. 
You know as much about these creatures as anyone. Enough to know that if you don't wipe it out, there won't be much for you to come home to. Yes. So, if you're willing, my colleague is waiting for you at the main portal controls. He will open the gates for you, Mr. Freeman. Do hurry. Half-Life was widely praised as 1998's Game of the Year, an even more impressive feat when you realize that 1998 also saw the release of Ocarina of Time, Grim Fandango, Banjo-Kazooie, and Metal Gear Solid. Holy shit, 1998 was amazing! Or at least it was right up until you got to the Zen chapter of Half-Life. Were you enjoying your cool, immersive, groundbreaking shooter? Well, I hope you like first-person platforming through an ugly-as-hell alien void, because that's what the game is now. After what feels like an eternity of hopping around on moving platforms through what looks like H.R. Geiger's back garden, you then get to explore the confusing and boring world of Zen, where you will shoot a load of alien pugs, a weird testicle monster, and a floating telepathic baby before the game ends, presumably out of embarrassment. Maybe Valve didn't think anyone would get this far and just put Zen in as a joke? Well, joke's on you, Valve. Shouldn't have made the rest of the game so excellent. Oh, wait, is that what's holding Half-Life 3 up? You're still working on the Zen end? Because I think I'd be fine if you just left that out and shipped it as is, guys. The border world, Zen, is in our control for the time being, thanks to you. Quite a nasty piece of work you managed over there. I am impressed. Those were the terrible, terrible levels that nearly ruined some of our favorite games. And now we'd like to hear from you and the terrible levels that nearly ruined your favorite games. And also, while you're here, why not click on some more videos by Outside Xbox before you leave those comments? So here we have the video calculated by...
Ow.
Access did he originally have? <sighs> I have scrolled over it somewhere. None. It's one of those times where I wish we had an AI. We're like, hey, where the hell is uh, Steve? No idea. That's fake Steve. Because I love how they nicknamed him fucking Steve. I've got to pee. The fuck? Your eyes scooped out? Eyes scooped out. I think I should get fake Steve.
good. He hasn't gone far. You know, I've got a wild hair up my ass. I actually have to be on this side. Oh, I know. It was just lagging. Sec. Three. That's space dumb shit. Two. That is a weird view of me. And space sec one. Is there one for the brig? Yeah, there is. Hmm. What about the test room? I was hearing about Ella having an inoculation spoon kind of freaks me out. Test chamber, please. That's just a regular monkey, but I was right. Oh, thank fuck, that's a regular monkey. <sighs> you know, little things. Could have swore. I'm pretty sure she grabbed him. Yeah, there he is. Fake Steve. Mm. Hey, Chloe. Come on in. Mm -hmm. Oh, excuse me. Yes, that flashed.
Dude had rotten luck. Conspirators again? I just want to go in the ball pit this time. Ball pit, best fit.
put a banging donk on it. <laughs>